And if you're watching online, thank you for tuning in there as well. And come now, fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. O oh, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise, and teach me some melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy Here I raise, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. Oh, and I hope by thy good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. My Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the Interpose his precious love. Oh, to grace, oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I constrained to be. Oh, let thy grace, Lord, like a feather, find my wandering heart to thee. I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love. And here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy course. I'm prone to wander, sing it again. I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the your prayer. Oh, here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy course of love. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome. Hello, hello. Oh. Hey, I'm Ted, uh, deacon here at Gallatin Church. Glad to have you all this morning. Whether you're here sitting with us right in front of us or online, thank you for choosing to be with Gallatin Church this morning. Hey, just wanted to mention to you that you already know this since you're here. We're a church, so our goal is to preach the Word of God, help you have a, one, have a relationship with God, two, have a growing relationship with God, and three, get to know each other and have fellowship, and then serve not only each other, but the community that we live in. That's our goal. If we talk about current anything going on, it's going to relate to the Word of God and how you can live your life the way He wants you to in this environment. That's all of our, that's our goal for you. And I hope today that God will touch you through His Word, through the music, and that you will be a different person today and in every day. So as we prepare ourselves for um, worship, let's go to him in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for this time. We thank you so much for each person here. Lord, I pray for every family member here. I ask that your blessing would be on them. Lord, we just ask that you would open our hearts and minds to hear you today. And to just respond to you today, Lord, whatever, whatever that would be, whatever that response is. We thank you and we love you. We just ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
may notice a few uh, people missing on the praise and worship team. The, uh, the backbone of our crew had to start quarantining on Friday. Um, so we would like to just pause and pray this morning for uh, Mitch and Sarah. Um, we think that they are doing okay, but of course having a little one, they're trying to be as careful as they can. Uh, his sister does have COVID-19. So um, just uh, pray for all those who we know are still affected. Um, we know that the rates are back up because it is flu season, and we knew that this wave was coming, but it doesn't make it any easier. And again, it's affecting many people, young and old, several on the Goodlesville campus as well this week. We've had special prayer request for um, COVID-19. So let's just pause a moment and do that as well. Father God, we just pray for Mitch and Sarah. We pray for uh, Don and Jel Janice Llewellyn, God, and, and so many others, members at both campuses who have been directly affected this week by COVID-19. Again, Lord, we know that the numbers are up. We ask that we would continue to, to do our due diligence to uh, wash our hands and uh, be as safe as possible. God, that we would not sacrifice worshiping you because of this virus. God, whether that be here in this place or at home in living rooms and couches across, God, the greater Gallatin, Hendersonville, Goodlettsville, and Middle Tennessee area, Judea, Samaria, and to the utmost parts of the world. We pray, God, that this service today would reach the hearts of those who believe that they might be encouraged, that we might, again, as Ted said, look more like Christ when we leave here because of our time spent together, and that we may not forsake the gathering of themselves together, just like the church in Acts. Help us, God, now to bask in the presence of your Holy Spirit. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand and join us as we continue to worship him this morning. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, and you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, and I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship. You are here, oh, you turn lives around, and I worship you, oh, we worship you. You are here, and in every heart, and I worship you. Stop working, never stop working, never stop, 
never stop. Come on, church. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop. No. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. standing as Tori reads our scripture this morning. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of darkness in the world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. Then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, you cannot hide the light whom shall i fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still and whom shall i fear because i know I know who goes before me, and I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. deliver me yours is the victory oh, whom shall I fear whom shall I fear oh, I know who goes before me and I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by the one who reigns forever he is a friend of 
of mine, the God of angel armies, is always by my side. Nothing formed against me shall stand. Whoa. You hold the whole world in your God, we know this morning that we need you. God, but more than that, we need that peace that Tori just read about. We need that peace that passes all understanding. We need that peace, God, in our hearts. That passage tells us that peace is only found in your word. In your word of truth, help us to rest today, God, knowing that it is true, knowing that you are not the father of lies, but the author of truth. God, today as we hear your word taught, as we read the scripture, God, may again we align our lives to its truth. And God, may you point out where, if at all, we have missed the mark. We ask these things in the wonderful name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. made it. Good morning, Gallatin. Can we turn those house lights on? I want to see everybody's beautiful face. You all say, I wish I could see your beautiful face too, Tim. We, um, we are blessed to, today at the end of this service. You will have the opportunity to also be pray. Pray for uh, your new elders and deacons who have been elected. You voted on that last week, and our Goodlessville campus voted on that this morning. And you will get to meet most of them, and we're excited, excited about that. Again, one more time, if we could get the lights on in the house, that would be awesome. You know, some, uh, sometimes you plan your preaching, and, and then something happens that you need to change the plan. A few years ago, when I was early in the ministry, a tornado struck town just a day or two before I was to preach, and we changed the message. As a matter of fact, I just got an email this week. I, I get emails oftentimes from Tom Rainer, former uh, president of Lifeway, and he leads, a, uh, he leads a group called Church Answers, and I get a lot of information from them. It's very helpful. And he sent out an email this week to many of the pastors who subscribe to his blogs, and it says, 
How to know when to change your message because of what's happening in the world. And indeed, I believe the events of this week would have been worthy to change a message over. But I am also thankful that today, God in his sovereignty has led us to James chapter 4, verse 1 through 10. In James chapter 4, verse 1 through 10, here's the headline of that passage, How to End Wars. Could it be any more appropriate that we are talking about this subject today, knowing what's going on in our country? And so, let me just express to you today that I understand the dangers of speaking the truth in such a charged society. In many ways, we have elevated our politics above our religion. We've seen the fallout for it. Sometimes there are people who are more loyal to a distant politician than they are to leadership of their own churches. We select our churches sometimes even based upon their political leanings rather than their doctrines, their reputations, or their ministries. But here's my thought. When the pulpits of America are no longer allowed to inform the politics of America, we end up with a peg in America. I'm going to say that again because I came up with that and I think it's pretty good. When the pulpits of America are no longer allowed to inform the politics of America, we end up with a pagan America. I enjoy politics. I loved uh, those classes, civics, etc., history, when I was in school. I have been to the Capitol building in, in Washington, D.C. a couple times, got the tour down, even in the bowels of it. It's fascinating. They have, this, they have the very gurney that President Lincoln was laid out upon when he was visited there as, as after he died. I sat in the office of one of the senators, actually Elizabeth Dole. I got to travel on that underground railroad that goes back and forth between the Capitol and, and the office buildings. I love that. I, I have a great admiration and appreciation for that, the, the awe and respect of what our founding fathers left us and gave us. And I also have participated in politics. I was in a city council for 10 years. I didn't have to register as a Republican or Democrat to be in that, and so I thought it would be something safe. And I feel like I did some good for the community. And I was even approached by not only the House, uh, the State House, but also the Senate in Kentucky asking me if I would run for office. And it was tempting because, like I said, I valued them and I valued the work. But I stepped aside and I said, no, I don't think so, because honestly, I feel like the greater job that I can do is preach the truth. Because the only real change that's going to come in our nation is when God changes the hearts of men and women. And so I also felt like I would have to declare, uh, I'd have to declare allegiance to a particular party. And I don't believe that there's any party that's unsullied by, by, by their actions. And so I didn't want to bring that onto my role as a pastor. And so, again, however, we need to understand that our, our founding fathers as a nation understood that there's no way you can govern a bunch of people who aren't obedient to the word of God. They understood the importance of having a group of people who understood the principles of God and agreed to them, at least in principle. And so today we take this incredible text from James that was planned, by the way, months ago. We make application not only in our personal life, but hopefully in our, our national lives and see what James has to say about the theme of war. As we're in James chapter 4, verse 1 through 10, we find that he describes three types of wars that are going on in the world. We're going to get into those. And he also gives us four steps to finding peace. We call them four steps to serenity, and I'll give you those as well. So join with me as we look at James chapter 4, and I begin in verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? <laughs> Is there any doubt that God in his sovereignty had, had us in this passage this week? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? That word enmity is a word you probably don't use much, but that means to make yourself an enemy. It means to be at war. And so it goes on. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. 
Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why the Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And so, as I mentioned earlier, in this passage, James has shown us three types of war that's going on in our world today. And the first one we see is this. It's the one that's most obvious, war with others. Now, this is throughout the whole passage chapter, uh, but we, f- we find it again in verse 1, what causes fights and quarrels among you. And then in verses 11 and 12, uh, we did not read those today, but it gives a little bit more inclination where those wars are. And so, have you ever found yourself at war with somebody? Nobody? All right, well, then I don't have to preach this today. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I, sometimes when I know that I'm planning, I'm preaching something, I almost dread it because I know that God will give me a personal opportunity to practice what I'm be preaching. And so this week, the same. I, 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 I had conflict with somebody this week and, and I, I don't enjoy that. I don't like it. I, didn't, I don't think I cause it. I don't think I initiate it. But nonetheless, we find ourselves at times in conflict as a matter of fact, conflict isn't so bad. Conflict is when two people have different ideas and they share those together and we have intense moments of fellowship. But anger and war is bad because war, by very definition, brings destruction. And so we find ourselves at war with others. I want you to think who you might find yourself at war with. You ever found yourself, don't, don't answer out loud. Ever found yourself at war with a spouse, the person who's supposed to be your greatest ally? Ever find yourself at war with your children or your parents or your cousins? You ever find yourself at war with a boss or boss with an employee or within your workplace at school or church or work? And by the way, speaking of church, how many of you know that wars happen in church? They happen in church. Now, it should not happen, but it does happen. And and we're going to see why here in a moment. And so we see that in the scriptures, we see that the Psalm 133 tells us that brothers and sisters ought to dwell together in harmony and love. Isn't that awesome? That's how we ought to be. We ought to dwell together in love and harmony, except in the Bible we see that that's not always the case. So even God's people, even heroes of the faith, struggled. As a matter of fact, Lot quarreled with Abraham. Absalom went to war with his father, David. The disciples of Christ argued who would be the greatest. And even Paul and Barnabas argued over John Mark and his role. So we see that happen according to people, but also within the churches. At Corinth, brethren were suing one another. They were competing in public assemblies. In Galatia, the brothers and sisters were biting and devouring one another. And even the sweet church at Philippi, there were two women who had trouble getting along with one another. Can you imagine? (laughs) And so we see, we see that there are, these, there are these possibilities of opponents, all kinds of possibilities of opponents. But we also see there are possible flashpoints. In his epistle, James implies several different kinds of flashpoints or potential flashpoints that were there in his day. Class wars in chapter 2, verse 1 through 9. How many of you know there are class wars going on in every nation in the world today? Employment wars in chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. Church fights in chapter 1 and also in chapter 3. And personal wars, as we mentioned, were discussed in verse 1 and also in verse 11 and 12. So we're admonished to speak not evil against one another. We're admonished not to judge. And yet, how many times do we, who, and by the way, James is writing to Christians, do we find ourselves at war? There is no peace, there is attack, there is fighting, and there is fallout. What do you observe around you today? Can you observe some wars happening? If not, turn on the news. And let me ask you this question. When do you find yourself at war? Some of you right now have hard feelings. You have bitterness, you have anger. 
There's people that you hold in resentment. It may be a cold war where you just don't talk anymore. Or it may be full out nuclear attack. Kind of happens like this. Somebody throws a pebble at you so you feel like you've got to throw a boulder back at them. So they feel like they've got to throw the whole mountain at you. And then you feel like you've got to throw the whole planet back at them. It sounds like a Marvel movie. And that's typically the way it goes. And so many of us live that way. And James, again, is writing to the church. And he, he, he lets us know that it's not okay to be at war with anybody. It's not okay, regardless of what the flashpoint is. It's not okay, regardless of the reasoning. It's not okay. Now listen, let me just pause right here. This morning we sang songs. The God of angel armies is always on my side. We, we have the great hymns of the faith. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war. And I believe there's a tremendous misunderstanding in the church today. What that means. At the Capitol, we had people saying, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Trump? Don't equate those two together. They are not the same. And the way we go to war is not the same. Jesus showed us how to go to war. When he was hung on the cross, you know what he could have done? The Bible tells us, Olivia, that he could have called a legion of angels. That's at least 10,000. And it says they could have destroyed the world and set him free. But what did he do? He looked down on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's how Jesus goes to war. When he instructed us and he says, if somebody strikes you on the cheek, he says what? Turn the other cheek. He says, you want to, you want to know how to be, defeat your enemy? Speak blessings on them. When you bless your enemy, they'll, it'll be like heaping coals of ash on their head. In other words, they'll repent. Jesus, by the way, did the greatest service to you because the Bible says while we were still, while you were still, say it, while I was still his enemies, Christ died for me. And you know what he did? In so doing, he made us his friends. He says, I no longer call you my enemies. I call you my friends. Hallelujah. That's how God goes to war against Satan. And we will never win the war in politics. We'll never win the war in our, in our places of business, in our schools, in our homes, and in our relationships until we learn the way we go to war is by loving, not cursing. And too many times in America, we go back to our founding fathers. I want you to know that none of them wanted to go to war. They worked for years to work out the grievances. All they wanted was representation. And they were willing to stand up for it, but they were not looking for it. And thus they created for us a system of government where we could have our grievances handled without fighting at the Capitol. And so we have... Wars with others, but there's a second war that we have, and that is this. There is a war within ourselves. The root, the reason we are at war with one another is because there is a war within our hearts that causes wars in the church and everywhere else. You see, here's what he says. It's your desire for things that satisfy. That's the problem. You, have, you want possessions, you want power, you want, you want prestige, you, you want luxuries, you want things. And so it will cause you to fight. Last week, we talked about godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. And we talked about party factions. And they gave you a definition. Selfishness is saying my, my, my. But selfishness is also saying my group, my family, my school, my, my, my work group at, at work, my, my business. You see, that's a party. And typically, we can extend our selfishness to somebody's that are around us. Boy, we're seeing that right now in the United States of America. And so we see here then that kind of war begins in the heart. Simply put, the verse 1 tells us that the real problem in all of our hearts is selfishness. That's the root. The war within ourselves comes because we are selfish. I say this a million times. It's my best illustration. There are six billion people in the world right now, and you're the only one thinking of you. You, you want to have problems? Think that all the rest of them ought to be thinking of you. When you drive to work in the morning, think that everybody in the road should be thinking about you. You see those kind of people, don't you? They're honking. They can't believe that you're in their way. Why aren't you going 120? I can tell you why I'm not going 100. I don't have a car that will go 120. All they think about is themselves. And so there becomes a war within themselves. That's the root of it. The fruit of it leads to a few things. We see in verse 2, 
you, they come from your selfish desires that battle within you. You desire, but you do not have. So you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You see, the root is selfishness. The fruits are murders and wars and, 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 and fightings and a lack of peace. And so we see here that you murder. And here, here is the thing. Jesus tells us. He said, remember, when you look at the woman with lust, you, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Same thing when you have anger against somebody and you don't resolve it. You've already committed murder in your heart. You see what he's talking about here? He's talking about stopping it at its source before it comes in action. The actions may come out in literal murder, but it may also come out in just cold feelings, hard feelings, distances, a lack of peace, a lack of a lack of working together. And so the root is selfishness. The fruit are wrong actions. And also, secondly, the second fruit of this mess in our lives is wrong praying. Yes, I said it. You can pray wrong. James makes it clear. Number one, you have not because you ask not. So you're not praying. But many people who are praying are praying in the wrong way. And so you're praying with selfish desires. And I, I read an illustration. I think it's absolutely perfect to understand why God doesn't answer so many of our prayers. Are you ready? God doesn't enter our prayer, answer our prayers sometimes because our prayers are like a wife who goes to her husband and says, Husband, I believe that you can supply this for me. I ask you, I implore you, I beg you, please give me one of your friends to lie with and commit adultery. Now, do you think the husband's going to answer that prayer? The same thing with God who hears us say, I want you to come and I want you to give me things that will lead me away from you. You see, for us, it's not about adultery, but it's about idolatry. And so we ask God for things that will lead us away from him. Things that suffice our, our heart's desire, our passions, our flesh, but not things that draw us closer to him. So we have not because we ask not. Why? Because we're asking selfishly. So when Jesus teaches us to pray, he doesn't say, oh, God, I want a brand new Ferrari. And I do. That way I can stay ahead of those people on the interstate. No, when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, Father, thy will be done. Did you get that? And not only did he teach us to do that, but listen, friends, when he was in the garden, he prayed, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. If you want to have an active and alive prayer life that sees results, begin with, God, I submit all of this to you. I want what you want. And start trying to discern what it is that God wants. And it's not hard. It's right there in Scripture. And so the reason that we, that we are fighting within ourselves is because we're selfish. What the results are, bad actions and bad praying. But ultimately... The problem isn't with others and the problem isn't necessarily with ourselves. The problem is with God. We have a problem with him and we're at war with God. That's the third war that we find ourselves in. And by the way, I've seen people who are at war all the time. You know the kind I'm talking about. They're constantly at war with everybody. And you know what? I've observed that people who are at war with many people have one common denominator. They're the ones that are at war with all the other people. And so when I see somebody that's constantly having a problem with this person, that person, the other person, I assume that that person is the one that has the problem. If you find yourself today in conflict in multiple places, you might need to just analyze and ask yourself, am I at war with God? You see, that's what he tells us in verses 4 through 10. Here, the root cause of every war, internal or external, is rebellion against God. You see, here's how it goes. In some way, those who are at war with others are also at war with themselves because they are first at war with God. And so the root of all problems is that we are at war with God. But the route that it takes is a different story. Let me talk to you about the route. And so here's James, and he gives us some ways that we follow a path towards war with God. And it starts with being friendly with God's enemies. James mentions three enemies we must not fraternize with if we want to be at peace. Are you ready? Write these down. The first enemy of God that you don't want to be in league with if you want to have peace is the world. Last week, we talked about worldly wisdom versus heavenly wisdom. If you didn't catch that, I encourage you to go back so I don't have to preach it again today. But to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy with God. The Bible is very clear about that. And so what is the world? 
The world's all about itself. It's about getting my way. You saw it this week. We didn't get our way, so here's what's going to happen. And we, we tend to do that in every aspect of our lives. And so the world says, go out, you get it, it's all about you. Now it's funny, because the world says it's all about you, but in the meantime, they want you to admit that it's all about them. It just doesn't work. And so human society is contrary to God. Any conduct, belief, or thought which is anti-God or anti-Christ is worldly. And to be a friend of such makes one an enemy with God. It makes one a spiritual adulterer or adulteress. And so the route to being an enemy of God, to fighting with God, flows through being a friend of the world. Secondly, a friend of the flesh. In verses 1 and verses 5, he makes it very clear that we are those who are following the flesh when we're at war. Let me just read verse 1 again. Where do causes, uh, where, what causes fights and quarrels amongst you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? Verse 5, or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? And so, in other words, the flesh. Now, here's a heads up. You all were born in the flesh. And you are still in the flesh. You walked in here this morning in the flesh. Right about now, your flesh is saying, mmm, a burrito would be awful good. That's your flesh. Your flesh also says you should be more important. The flesh causes you to be impatient. The, the flesh causes you to think about your own passions, your own comfort, your own privilege, your own position. The flesh, you are born with that. As a matter of fact, I bet when these boys were young, you didn't have to train them at the age of two to say the word my. They probably just picked that up. And when they turned into little rotten nicks at the age of two or around that time, that wasn't because you trained them to do that way, because they were in the flesh. The Bible tells us that in the flesh we cannot please God. The Bible tells us that we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Even our righteousness in the flesh is as filthy rags. And the Bible says, by the way, there is no one righteous, no, not one. And so in the flesh, we cannot be pleasing to God. In the flesh, we make ourselves an enemy of God. What is that unlawful desire that leads you away from God? What is the desire that rages a war within you and that God, God won't allow you to have, even though you want it, because it would draw you away from him? These things are in direct conflict with our relationship with God. Submit to these desires, these works of the flesh, set us in opposition to the Spirit. And so if you want a war within you, give in to the flesh, at the same time have the Holy Spirit of God, your conscience speaking to you. There's not going to be peace in a life that's lived outside of the will of God. How many Christians do we know today who have been saved and yet ignore the Spirit of God speaking to them? Ignore the righteousness of God trying to work through them. And they wonder why there's no peace inside them. There's no peace with others. Why? Because they're at war with God. I told you he listed three enemies of God that we, became, that we tend to befriend. You know what the third one is? We have the world, we have the flesh, and we have the devil. I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a friend of the devil. Oh, really? Every time you embrace your selfishness, Every time you embrace your pride, every time you put your own comforts, your own desires, your own will ahead of God, you are Satan's best friend because you're doing exactly what he wants you to do. The Bible tells us in verse 6, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Ultimately, it can all be traced to that. Why did Adam and Eve have war with God? Why did they have war within themselves? Why did they have war with one another? It came because they were a friend of the serpent there in the garden, the devil. And so whenever you break down into conflict, either a cold war, whether you're yelling, whether you are running away, whether you are attacking, whatever it is, you have demonstrated that you are being a friend with Satan himself. And what is his greatest tool? What is the thing that he draws you with the most? Pride. How do you get a mouse? You put a little cheese on the trap. Maybe a little peanut butter because you know the mouse is drawn to those things. So don't you know that you and I are drawn to our own pride? Can you believe such and such said this about you? I can't believe they ignore me. They forgot this or they said that. When our pride is attacked, Satan is basically baiting the hook ready to lure you in.
to a war with God. When we give in to pride, we become friends of the devil and enemies of God. And so today, is it possible that you've been at war with God? James, again, is writing to Christians. He's writing to Christians that have a tendency to be at war with one another, probably having a war within themselves, and definitely the root of all of this is at war with God. But thank God he doesn't leave us there. Now, I'm going to encourage you. I want you to memorize these four steps to serenity. It's not going to be hard. These are four things that James says are vitally important. James says they are because the Holy Spirit of God is working through James to make sure that we know these. And they're not hard to get, but they are four steps to serenity, four steps to cease wars. Number one, he says in verse seven, submit yourselves to God. You've got to submit to God. Everybody say that with me. We've got to number one, submit to God. What's it mean to submit to God? The word in the Greek literally means to fall into, fall into the proper rank. That means to be in the right order. When a, when a private acts like a general, there's going to be trouble. And that's what happens when we usurp God's authority over our lives. We want to be the boss. Problems ensue. Unconditional surrender to God is the only way to victory. Submission is saying, not my will, but yours be done. How often do you say it? How often do you say it? When your pride's insulted and you want to lash out, how often do you say, not my will, but yours be done? I'm not going to love the way the world says to love. That's conditional. I'm going to love the way you taught me to love. I'm going to submit to your way. Your ways are higher than my ways. How many times do you do it? When it's a temptation to do something unethical at work, how many times do you say, God, I submit to you, not my will, but yours be done? When you want to lash out in anger, how many times do you say, not my will, but yours be done? Jesus did it. Don't you know that on the cross, the human side of him wanted to kill the people that were spitting in his face? How many of you would have wanted to do that if you were on the cross? If you could have hung on the cross and said with the word, angels come and destroy the world and set me free, how many of you would have done it? I, I should see every hand in this room go up because that's the nature of man. We have to submit, though, to God. And Jesus had already done it when he said, I want this cup to pass, but nonetheless, if, I, if it can't, your will be done. And as he was on the cross, the bitter cup was what he was drinking. You've got to submit to God. Number two, you've got to resist the devil. Let's say that one together. Ready? Resist the devil. Remember, he's behind every war we have, but we have to resist. Now, Lucas and I had a deep theological discussion the other day. I was up at church and Daniel came in with Lucas and, and, and the lights were off because the power was out. And it was getting to be kind of in that twilight part of the day. And he was a little nervous going down the hall. Cohen, you would never be nervous with that, would you, in the dark at the church? I didn't think you would. But the little brother was a little nervous. And I said, now, Lucas, now I want you to understand something. There's no such thing as ghosts. The Bible says that our spirits are either with God or they're not. And they're with the devil. And he said, yeah, there may not be ghosts, but there are demons. And they're more powerful. <laughs> well, he's right. Demons are powerful. But how many of you know greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world? Resist the devil and he will what? Walk away from you slowly? No, he will flee from you. We have everything that we need. The scripture was read earlier. We have the, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the word of truth. The, we have all that. And the Satan cannot hurt you. He cannot harm you. All you have to do is resist him. And when you resist him, it may be like this. The devil, listen here, devil, you're, you're wanting me to lash out. You're wanting me to be prideful. You're wanting me to ruin a relationship. You're wanting me to stand up for myself. You're wanting me to stand up for my party, my faction. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do things the way God wants me to do. I'm going to resist you. I'm going to submit to God. My ways are going to be his ways. Amen. You've got to go through that. I'm, I'm not exaggerating that that is the literal process that you have to do. You have to fight that battle in your heart, in your mind. You've got to say, I'm not going to be at war with God in front of the devil. I'm going to be an enemy of the devil at peace with God. And then you'll have peace within yourself. And then you'll have peace with one another. Submit to God, resist the devil. And then verse eight, he says to draw near to God. Let's say that one together. Draw near to God. This is not the same as submit to God. Draw near to God is something I hope you do on Sunday morning, but I also hope you do it daily. Draw near to God means that, that 
that we cleanse our hands. He says you've got to cleanse your hands. This is, this is a poetic way of saying that you've got to ask God to forgive you of your sins. Every day. Multiple times a day. You've got to know that sin is a barrier between us and a holy God. Please get this. Sin is a barrier between us and a holy God. Sinning is running away from God. You cannot run away from God and draw near to God at the same time. And so we have to confess our sin. And confession of sin is not, oh God, I'm sure I probably did something wrong. I'm sure that I did something. And so please forgive me of my sins. No, it's saying it. I had this attitude. I acted this way. I've got this thought. I need you to forgive me. Please forgive me of that. I repent. I turn away from that. I acknowledge it's wrong. I desire to follow you. Please forgive me. Cleanse me. What did the psalmist say? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit. And so we see here that we've got to draw near to God. How do you do that? You certainly do that through prayer. You certainly do that through the study of his word. You do that through listening to music that inspires you or that, that reveals God to you. You do that in your thoughts and your meditations. You've got, to pur- you've got to purify your hearts. You've got to cleanse your hands. By the way, purifying your hearts literally means you've got to be single-minded that God is going to be your one desire. You can't be double-minded. The Bible says a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. You can't be a friend with God and a friend of the world. You can't be a follower of God and a follower of the devil. You want to talk about peace not happening in your life. And so you've got to be single-minded. You've got to purify your hearts. That means I've got to give God my all. And so submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God. And then the third one is this. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Verse 9 and 10 tells us, if we will humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, what will he do? He will lift you up. Now, by the way, it's possible to be humble on the outside and full of pride on the inside. How many of you know these kind of Christians? Oh, they, they'll, they'll brag about their humility. They'll brag about uh, uh, all the things, all the struggles and all the things they go through. They'll, they'll look, and Jesus addressed it. You look like, okay, you fast so you can look skinny and, and miserable. And all you're getting from that is your own attention. Humility, true humility is mourning for our sins. That's how we can humble ourselves before God. You know, James says, and it's interesting He says, you've got to stop partying and you've got to start crying. That goes against the world's wisdom, doesn't it? You know what he's saying? He says, you've got to be deadly serious about this. You've got to get serious. This party mentality is all that's going to be fine is not what you need. Friends, I see this in the church today. There is not a single mind in this. There is not a weeping for the sin. I'm, I'm embarrassed for the church that in this nation, there is not a mourning in the churches today. We ought to be mourning what's happening in our country. But we also ought to mourn what's happening in our own hearts and our own lives. And so we submit to God. Say it with me. We submit to God. Number two, we resist the devil. Number three, we draw near to God. And number four, we humble ourselves. And so let me just bring this to a conclusion. Where are you having wars today? What's the struggle going on within your own heart? Where is your mind torn? Where have you been unserious about your walk with the Lord and found yourself having a playtime with the things of the world? Where are you struggling right now? Who are you struggling with? Isn't it time to do the things that God says? Isn't it time to take and submit to God? God, I'm going to do it your way, not my way. Isn't it time to resist the devil? Get thee behind me, Satan. I am not going to listen to you. Lead me astray. Isn't it time to draw near to God through prayer and through confession of our sins? And isn't it time to humble ourselves by repenting, by turning and admitting that God's ways are higher than ours and being willing to follow him? Isn't it time to do that? For the sake of peace in your life, for the sake of peace in your home, For the sake of peace in your workplace, amongst your friends, certainly in your church and in our nation, I pray that we would do these things. Only then will war cease. We won't be at war with God. We won't be at war with ourselves. And we won't be at war with others. 
Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs, when a man's ways pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's my prayer for you. So the musicians are going to sing, and we planned this service months ago, again, not knowing what would be happening in our world today, but we did know that what James wrote here requires us to respond. Response is hearing the word of God, and we're either going to reject it and continue to do the things that we used to, or we're going to accept it. We're going to repent. That means we're going to turn away from the old passions and desires, and we're going to accept God's way, and we're going to walk in a new way. And so today, I don't know where your struggle is. I don't know what's going on in your life. But I do know what's going on in this world, too oftentimes in the church. And I pray that right now you would seek God's face. And that if you have an enemy, you would take care of that. You know, the Bible gave us one way to check this. It's like a reminder on your cell phone. It said anytime you come to the table to have communion, you don't take that communion if somebody's got animosity towards you and you have animosity towards them. You resolve it. And so there's a reminder there for us that this is something that we continually must do. Today, this is your time as the music plays. I'm just going to ask you right where you are if you would repent. Now, by the way, there's one more extremely important thing in this. God should have wiped us out. If he were a person, he would have. But he loved us. The Bible says he loved us so much that he gave his only son. Here's what happened. Instead of destroying us, Jesus looks down from the cross and says, Father, forgive them. And God will forgive us if we simply ask for that forgiveness. So today, if we acknowledge that we're sinners separated from God, that we are his enemies, and the Bible says that we are, we can be his friends. And the Bible also says that Jesus says, you are no longer my enemies, but you are my friends. How does that happen? By asking for forgiveness of sins, by trusting that he will turning our lives over to him, basically saying, you're the boss now, not me. So today, if you need to make that decision, you can make that decision right where you are by simply saying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve death. I know I've been your enemy, but I know that you sent your son to die for me. I know that you'll forgive my sins because of what he's done. And I'm just going to trust you with that. And I want to live my life for you today, right where you are. You can make that your prayer. If you make that your prayer, I want you to let Daniel know that after service today. You can let him know or you can let me know. We want to help you in that next step to being a friend with God. This is your time. sinners, Christ died for forgiveness of our sin. And I 
was young, though, still young love far from me. But you have been so, so good to me. Lord, you paid it all for me. And you have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love, God. No, oh, it chases me down. Pastor Daniel here again. Thank you so much again for joining us in worship online today. I want to encourage you to continue to be faithful to God in your actions, in your word, and in your deed, and of course in your giving. Uh, your church, Gallatin Church, has been extremely obedient to giving, uh, even in very uncertain times. And while we know that we're hopefully coming out of a pandemic soon and a vaccine is on the way or even being a minister now to healthcare professionals, we know that there are still uh, very uncertain and trying times in the days ahead and that 
We never have certainty really in what we know or what we don't know about what's going on in our world. But one thing that we do know is that our God is still in control, that Jesus is still Lord and his Holy Spirit has moved, I hope, in your hearts there where you're watching as it has here in the sanctuary at Gallatin Church. Thank you again and be sure to reach out if you have a decision, a prayer request, or anything that you need to talk to. Uh, email me here, gallatinchurchdaniel at gmail.com. God bless. Have a great week.